welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. I'd like to thank everyone for coming along for the ride, especially my good friend Mark. How are you? I will be sure to keep my hands and arms inside the vehicle at all times. Good stuff. I'm glad everyone understands what we're going for in this podcast and what our vision is, and thank you for following us all along. My and vision is kind of Space Mountain meets teacups. I was just hoping if, if our listeners knew what our vision was, they could email me, because I have no idea. <laughs> So anyway, long story short, this is a podcast about board games, where Mark and I talk about the games that we played this week, we talk about the news and why it doesn't matter, we talk about our topic this week, which is Rondells, but first, we're going to talk about the game we reviewed last year. Mark? Yes, our as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Aurus, is Gloomhaven. It's very timely, what with the release of Jaws of the Lion. True, and just and Frosthaven just wrapping up its huge Kickstarter. Absolutely. We were moved to review Gloomhaven not because we had just started playing it. In fact, we had finished, we had kind of let our campaign peter out. We didn't really finish it because the narrative didn't grab us as much as the gameplay did. And we'd played dozens of times. But we were moved to review it because people wanted us to review it, so we did. And we are slaves to your whims as ever. Uh, Gloomhaven remains brilliant. I wish I could get Jaws of the Lion, but you know. Border closed. A couple of viewers have been volunteering to scope out targets for us, but so far, no luck. No luck, eh? Yeah, it's a shame. What else was there? Something else at Target that I wanted to grab. I've forgotten already, though. We're denied the works of Prospero Hall. We're denied Jaws of the Lion. Since reviewing it, I had had the chance to introduce Gloomhaven to a friend of mine who uh, I used to live in proximity to, but then moved to the West Coast because everyone I know moves to California. I figured the Walker California clock has, has started ticking ever since we started the podcast. It's I don't only think, a matter of time. I really don't think you're going to have to worry about that. It's a matter of time. It's an inevitability. And she was immediately taken with it. Uh, it was one of those situations where halfway through the game, she was on her phone ordering a copy of the game for her and her partner. It was uh, a, an immediate convert, and I played a bunch of games with her, and Gloomhaven remains brilliant. The core system is just so good. And I'm, I'm sure when Frosthaven shows up, I'm sure we'll dive into that pretty hard for a couple weeks anyway, if we get... Uh... What's the what's the other one we have to get back to the Grail? Hopefully we'll get Grail back to the table. That Take would be Grail, amazing. Fall of Avalon, yes. Yes. And I did see, in terms of positive news, Isaac Childress, who's a very responsive game designer, has responded to the enthusiasm of the booklet format of doing scenarios, and he plans on trying to design a booklet format scenario book for both Gloomhaven and for Frosthaven as separate available products and it's gonna be he, difficult but and did he say that he got the idea from a podcast in the first place yeah uh, i he, bet you he didn't well he cited his lord and personal savior walker i don't know if he meant you or some other personal savior walker i'm just saying so on to the games we played this week mark i finally got i like to i shouldn't say a solo game because it wasn't it's not it's not really based on being solo but i got to play i played through a Reichbusters mission all by myself. Oh, really? Really. And it's it's very much more of a card game than I thought it would be. Because every single character has its own deck of 12 cards. And you're going to start with two of their main cards and two cards at random. And a lot of these cards have a free actions on them. And you're only allowed to do two actions on your turn. And one of the actions is to draw two cards. So if the cards have lots of free actions and you get to draw a lot of cards, well, guess what? playing the cards is the way to go right and they have all sorts of, so you might not get the cards you you know particularly need because it's not always exactly the action that you need but a lot of them are very powerful and it seems to be it seems very interesting the very way you know to get combos it's like okay i do i draw some cards or you know i happen to have a lot of cards at the time and and i use an action to move and then i use a card to move again or to you know create more damage or the way to combo up your regular actions and what's happening around you. And one of the, one of the characters that you start with is the, the sergeant or something. And he gets to use his cards and other characters. I think, I think this is going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to showing it to you. Oh, that's cool. That reminds me, honestly, the way you describe the action system reminds me of Warfighter because the core player soldiers, you can have player soldiers, you can have non-player soldiers, you can have uh, squaddies. And the player soldiers, the reason why they're powerful is because they have action cards. And indeed, a lot of the action cards let you do an action for free without spending an action. And it's an action to discard in as many cards as you want and then draw up to your hand. And that kind of hand management in conjunction with action management, and it's exactly as you say, sometimes the bonus action isn't exactly what you want, but hey, it's free. So it's about making use of that, those additional synergies. Look, that sounds very promising. What about all the stealth stuff? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's very interesting. I'm wondering if it's a lot of upkeep to take care of all the time. But every almost every action 
not almost every action level, anything that you think would create noise, like shooting a gun or rubbaging through a room, it all creates noise, and it'll tell you how many noise dice to roll, and then you have a target number. Anything you roll in the dice will trigger it. Like, the target number is one, right? So unless you roll all blanks, sometimes it's just roll one dice. You know, sometimes you're only rolling a few. So you're always drawing a card. And the interesting thing is that there's a threshold, right? So you could draw a card that would be seven. So as long as you didn't roll seven symbols, like, you're going to, you know, take whatever penalties on the top, which might be roll some blank dice or add something to the roll. And then if you still didn't hit the threshold, then you don't have to do the bottom. And the bottom part is usually the part that is really bad where, like, a... a a patrol will come through the door or something really bad will happen. So other than that, I love the sound system, but then the same thing happens. Does the sound system bring in the funk? It does. It It brings in the noise. It it brings in the funk. It also drops the beat. Oh, excellent. Yes. The other part is the, the alert system, right? So not only are you keeping track of sound all the time, but you also keep track of the status of the room. So it either has no status or it's suspicious or it's alert. And it's all these, the rule book I found was a little unclear about when these statuses change. Well, that was the first thing you were talking about in terms of Reichbusters. You got your Reichbusters in and you kept talking about, well, I'd like to play it, but they're all these errata. Well, I'd like to play it, but they're all these facts. So at the end of the day, you still found it a little bit ambiguous in That's some right. cases? Yes. Yeah. Even watching, I tried to watch a bunch of videos to try to get all the different examples, but it's like, okay, you know, is it when the enemy sees you and then they see you again or when you shoot? I think I've got it down now, but I, I just it's just like one of these things on top of everything else, but... I'm I'm looking forward to it, and I think in every game like this, when there when it's like uh, an adventure type game, they always make the first mission dead easy. Yes, and I, f- I think they made this first one a little too dead easy because mm. it made it seem as though like there was no possible way that you could be stopped. Reichbusters is like an alternate World War II dirty dozen game. You're sending in these elite uh, allied soldiers, and they're you know fighting the Nazis. So, but in this particular world, the Nazis have uh, found this particular stuff called the Viral, and it's like bringing people back to life and making these super soldiers. So the very first mission is is going in and finding the files, the fact that this Viral actually exists, right? And then you're going to go even deeper, and the zombies will start coming out. But I think in the end, it's going to be pretty interesting. Well, I'll certainly give it a shot. I'm I'm always willing to be disappointed with those kinds of co-op adventure things. And that is Reichbusters by Mythic Games. I played a quick two-player game called Hanami Koji. This is a game by Kota Nakayama, and it is about... Initially, you have to be very careful because it's it's about attracting geishas and based on very common cultural misapprehensions about what geishas were and what they did uh, and leaving out the salient detail that is only present on the back of the box that you are a restaurateur. And so you're effectively attracting hostesses to your restaurant. That's, that's, more, that's basically what you're doing. But it's a two-player card game, and it, immediately I started getting the vibe of Reiner Knizia two-player card games, which is high price. Because in Reiner Knizia two-player card games, by and large, you do not want to take your turn. In Hanami Koji, you have four different actions available, and you have to do them all, but in whatever order you want. One of them is burn two cards out the game. One of them is play a card secretly. One of them is play three cards. Your opponent picks one of them to play, and then you play the other two. And the final one is play four cards, divide them up into two piles. Your opponent picks one pile to play. You pick the other pile to play. So, aside from the play one card face down in secret, you are never able to deliberately play any card. You have to hope that your opponent leaves it for you. The rest of the time, you look at your hand and figure, ah, this is a great hand. Wait, how am I going to make sure I get to play it properly? Mm. And so it's one of those delightful elements of tension where you don't want to make any moves, but you have to. And I really enjoyed it. And the system was very clean, very quick, and very visceral. The subsequent rounds I found less appealing because once uh, a geisha has been attracted to your side, if you don't win outright, and the victory conditions are doable in one round, but not necessarily a slam dunk, in order to attract them to the other side, you need to strictly win. A tie will mean that whoever won it in the, in the previous round did. And I didn't like that dynamic quite as much, especially since in many cases, some of these geishas only have two or three cards in the entire deck. There's only two geishas that have four or five. And at that point, the margins are so thin that making a play to take one of those two or threes away from somebody else is just really chancy. Anyway, that was my experience from, from a couple of plays. I really enjoyed it. Would I play it over, as I say, Reiner Knizia two-player card games? Probably not. I love Battle Line and Shot and Totten and those versions, and they have that same vibe of every card play is a commitment, and I wish I could stall for time, but I can't. 
And as a result, I think that Hanami Koji, although very, very appealing, is very much in the sort of, well, you know, if you've already played some of these other Reiner Kinsey classics to death. Uh, Lost Cities is another example, solid design, whether the card game or the board game version. So Hanami Koji was very nice, and I liked the way the mechanisms work. And if you love that tension of not really having control, if you really like the I split, you choose mechanism, which Hanami Koji has, then it's absolutely something that I can recommend. I'm not a huge fan of the I split, you choose uh, mechanism, although it's done very, very well in Hanami Koji. So I enjoyed it, and I'll probably play it another couple of times. And it's very, very interesting, especially if you like those kinds of two-player card games. And that was Hanami Koji. All right. Lords of Waterdeep by Wizards of the Coast. It uh, went on sale. The, the digital version, so I played an awful lot of it for the past two weeks. And if you want just like a mindless worker placement game, which I feel has a lot of theme to it, you're sort of like a guild master and all these quests come up on the bulletin board and you have to gather up adventurers and send them out. And I would not play Lords of Waterdeep without the corruption expansion because it just adds everything to it. What it is is a, uh, a scale on the side and it's filled with all these skulls. And as the skulls come off, the negative victory points that they're worth goes up. So the more that go out, the worse it gets. And you can, you know, pass them to other people or lose yours and give them to other people or just make sure you don't have any and ditch all the ones from the track. So the ones that other people have are worth huge amounts of negative points. Overall, I think it's, you know, it's a fine game. And the fact that you can, you know, bust a game out really quickly online makes it super fun. When Lords of Waterdeep was originally released, it was kind of one of the early, very forgettable, bland legions of worker placement games. It was very much of its time. And I'm surprised at how much currency it still has, honestly, because there's an endless series of relatively bland, straightforward worker placement games, many of them designed by Stonemaier Games. And I, uh, some people really seem to like it. I guess it's the thematic hook, like the sort of uh bad D&D version where you're not actually going through in a dungeon but you're you're kind of the HR manager for, <laughs> for right. all bunch of fantasy adventures maybe that's why but it is it is very accessible and you can do worse for as you say a sort of bone standard kind of I wouldn't necessarily say mindless but it is pretty by the numbers it, well I mean like the only thing that that I think brings it to life for me or the or brings it to life for me are the buildings these buildings that you can build and when other people use them usually the person who built them gets a benefit now, the problem with that is that there's only one, even with the expansions, there's only one space on the board in order to build those buildings. So in a four-player game, if everyone builds the same amount of buildings, there's only two per player. And that's if everyone takes that action every turn. And, you know, with first player token flying around, one person could get it almost all the time. And so it's harder to get it out. And I just wish they had made different ways. And then there's some, there are some, just because, like I said, it's so hard to get it. There is a mission you can accomplish because when you build it, there's three face up ones and you get to choose which one you want to build. You pay the money and it goes out. There is a mission you can complete that builds all three of them f under your name oh, wow. for free, right? And it's really not that expensive. Usually, you know, I sort of justify it to the person who's playing against, well, look how many resources I had to pay to do that. Well, it really was, when you think about it, it really wasn't that many because not only did it give me all three of those buildings, but that's three actions in that one card because it would have taken me three actions. You know what I mean? It's so, so you're, much. So you're lying to your opponent to make them feel well, better at, about the first, abusive thing that you did. At first, I thought, well, I had to pay all these. <laughs> but then after reflection, it was like, well, that's not only is it, you know, th the three buildings I got for nothing. Well, not nothing, but I mean, but it's also the saving savings of those three actions I would have had to take to to build them. Which you know, is Walker, huge I, as well. I often find that your immediate reactions to games that I'm subjected to, I'm reminded of all your initial complaints that after the game is over, as we're putting it away, you're silent for a moment and say, yeah, I guess that is pretty cool. After I was trying to persuade you over the course of the game, it's good to know that your false reactions and your initial missteps are conveyed to other players as well. Fake news. Yeah. That's Lords of Waterdeep. I played Cartographers, a role-player game, and to be frank, I don't know what I was expecting. And <laughs> I didn't even know you had this. I heard a little bit, there's been a little bit of buzz about there this There has game. been a little bit of buzz. It's got a whole bunch of award nominations for things like Family Games. Is this and... the one where you do the stars? 
No, I'm th- you, like you draw pictures and you connect stars and you're writing on this big. I'm th- I'm thinking of something else. You, I think you're Go thinking ahead. of something else. Cartographers. There Go. there is drawing involved in cartographers. Okay. What happens is like every roll and write. This is a card based roll and write. You flip over a card and it says draw this pattern of this type of terrain on your map. And you've got this little map and you fill in this little grid with little trees or little houses or little wavy lines that are supposed to be water. And I seriously think that some of the charm is just the joy of being able to make little drawings and this kind of map arrives. Now, the map that comes out of it is not visually interesting at all. This is not like a big city situation. This is not even like a quiet year situation where you have this artifact at the end that's visually interesting and engaging. I could seriously look at an endgame map of Big City Anniversary Edition and be like, ooh, that's really cool. That kind of sort of looks like a city. But here's just a grid filled in with different kind of wavy lines and things. Part of this is because I can't draw but I've looked even at one at maps completed by people who can draw. Dr. Contra made a lovely little map and still was like, eh, whatever. The scoring is great. The scoring can, because roll and write games mostly live and die by their scoring conditions, because they're certainly not going to get by on their player interaction or novelty, that's for sure. The scoring conditions are great. It's very reminiscent of Isle of Sky. There are four different scoring conditions in round one, one and, uh, one and two score, in round two, two and three score, then three and four, then one and four. And they're, they genuinely pull you in different directions. And they might be things like, I want terrain of this type around the edges. I want terrain of this type around the mountains, etc., etc. The biggest problem I had with it, aside from it just being a roll and write game and my not finding those particularly interesting, is that even after my first play, or even midway through my first play, I got the solid impression that all my subsequent plays confirmed that you are going to do better if you memorize the types of shapes that are on the cards. The cards will give you specific pattern arrangements of various things, and so you need to know what ones are available. Imagine if playing in Carcassonne, it wasn't just a question of, well, I need a corner city piece in order to fill this, and I hope a corner city piece comes up. But imagine said it was far more specific, and you didn't know whether there were corner city pieces that existed in the deck. You would have to memorize. Now, it's a small deck. It's not It's not analogous to Carcassonne in the sense that there's a really, really big stack. But, but you, you can sort of assume, I guess, right? Because they sort of think of that ahead. You mean there's got to be, through gameplay, I'm sure they would have made the game so it could complete itself. It, it definitely can complete itself. You're not going to end up in, you're not going to spend most of the game unable to fill slots. But it w- really is helpful if you remember that, for example, one of the cards is a T arrangement consisting of six forests. And so if you want a forest to expand, you know that that shape is available. Now, if it, if, there, if you don't leave that specific shape available because you don't remember or you don't know, you can put it somewhere else. So very rarely is the case, like, I can't do anything with this. But I really felt that to play, quote-unquote, optimally, which is a strange sort of drive because roll-and-write games are not what you would call particularly strategically or tactically demanding or engaging. I would want to memorize the deck. And I don't like that impulse to have to memorize the deck. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it for a game that has more robustness to it. I'll forgive it in a case of a game like Blue Moon or Twilight Struggle. I'm not going to do it for a game like Role Player. And so while I like the scoring conditions, and I find the some of the visual appeal rather diverting, and of course it's quick and very, very accessible like all roll and write games, I really don't think that the... The, the, the particularity of the terrain restrictions really work to its favor. So uh, can I rec- recommend it as a roll and write game for gamers? Not really. So it, it kind of falls into the rest of the pack, like all the, all the rest of the roll and write games. I prefer dice to cards anyway when it comes to roll and write games. I find that, you know, it, it, unless, unless of course we're talking about something like Welcome to, where the deck is, not trackable in any realistic way because it's so big and the details are, are so minimal. But then again, I have serious misgivings about Welcome To, given that it, you know, is a hagiography for uh, <clears throat> racial segregation. But anyway, setting all that aside. So Cartographer is a role-player game. I understand why it's appealing. It seems like Thunderworks just wants to make roll and write games, and that <laughs> seems to be what they like to do. Uh, well, it seems fine. really interesting. There is the game I was talking about. Like, the fact that everyone's building the same map, that's kind of interesting and cool. They're not. Oh, they're not. They're not. They're not all writing on the same thing. No, they're not. Okay, well, s- s- pretend that was happening. Oh, that, that was my... that. That was the game that I, that I was that I have heard. What about. is this game? It's it's you're building these star charts. You'll be shown a picture, and you're to you're to uh, write it like a in straight lines. You're to draw and have people guess what you're drawing by using straight lines. And and then after you're done drawing it, if you keep it within a this particular size box, and you get bonus points. And everyone's drawing on the same map, and you and it's like building this big star chart by the end of the game. That sounds great. What's it called? Uh, that's a good question mark. Okay, well, it sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, just like tile-laying games, 
I prefer it when everyone's working off the same board, right? If you're going to be building a little tile map of something, you might be building your own little cute little city, but I'd rather everybody work, work on the same board. Similarly, if there were a roll and write game where you're legitimately interacting with each other with what's on the board, that would probably be more interesting. Then, of course, you can't claim that the game is playable up to 100 players simultaneously, though, which is also the other thing that cartographers claims. You know, they say player count 1 to 100, which is something. <laughs> Just a second now. It looks like it's called Starlink. This is it. Yes. So it's this game called Starlink where you're you're drawing out these constellations. So when you're drawing your little picture, you're making straight lines and you're trying to keep it within the box and you're going to score bonus points. And at the end of the game, you've all drawn this big astral image of, of stars. Have you played it? No. That sounds cool. I would try that game. But the game I played is called Cartographer's Oral Player Game. Lastly, for me, I finally got to play Barrage again. Now, Barrage is this fantastic game where Barrage means the overflow water over a dam or some such interpretation thereof. So what's happening in Barrage is all this water is coming down these rivers and you're putting in dams and, and power generation stations and converters. And depending on who owns what, you're converting this excess water into power or it's just running off the board or you're getting more frogs or more spaceships in order to build your engine faster. And it's, I think it's just a really fantastic game. It's one of the best heavy Euros of the past couple of years, that is for sure. Or medium heavy. It's not that, it's not particularly heavy. But as I warned Huey, who was the third person we played with, this is a game that's going to make you feel stupid. Because you look at the board, you look at your requirements, you're like, what on earth can I do with myself? It's not that these strategic horizons are narrow, but it's rather that getting things done is difficult. Everything is expensive and you feel the resource drain on everything and it's a challenge to get done what you need to get done and so as a result every time you're able to eke out one little bonus it feels real good what i find the most interesting part in barrage is your own uh, economic system you're going to start with an x amount of money and you can increase it very minimally during the game and what you do is when you spend something it goes into this rondelle i'm sure more on this later and then every time you build something it turns or you can do other actions that let you turn it to go around and then it releases your funds back again right so you can't spend that money until it goes all the way around the rondelle and you get it back again well not money but frogs or spaceships sort of frogs or spaceships yes and then and then you're good and it's it's just interesting managing that like wondering okay if i put this much in now i want to do this in four turns is there any way i can get this rondelle back around again in order to get you know, this money back so I can get those spaceships back out. Because you get bonuses for building lots of the same building, which is extremely difficult because as you build buildings, your resources get tied up. And so the economic model forces you to, di to diversify, which is nice, but that's not really the way to get these huge bonuses. And all the while, this is, this is why Barrage is such a good worker placement game, and Lords of Waterdeep doesn't really do it for me in nearly the same way. In Barrage, you are constantly bumping up against everybody because you all need those action spaces, and the order becomes very crucial, and you care very deeply about what everyone's doing. It, not only is it crucial, like, on, on the action spaces, but on the board itself. You know, you finally got your own little system worked out, you're getting your water, and then some awful, mean-spirited evil person this person sounds terrible damns the water in front of you who like would, some sort who, of who would do that eco terrorist <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sounds like the actions of a real jerk i, I wonder why you would ever play games with I, such I, an individual i have no idea it's amazing. Barrage is by Tommaso Batista, who is not someone we're very familiar with. And Simone Luciani, by the way, we were corrected on some of our Italian name pronunciation. Uh, it's Daniele Tascini. There are three gotcha. syllables. Similarly, there are three syllables in Simone. And we are a big fan of the Italian designers for their medium weight Euro games. And Barrage is definitely one of the best. It's a shame about the fulfillment, though. Every once in a while, I pop over on Board Game Geek and I see yet new waves of Cranio Creations royally giving the shaft to Kickstarter backers. We got this retail. The retail version has better components than the Kickstarter version does. And it just seems like, honestly, either, either in good, you can extend Cranio Creations good faith and say everything and, and, and believe everything they say, in which case they've had the worst luck and miscommunication from all their suppliers and their shippers, or they're playing fast and loose with some timelines. I don't know the details. I don't know what's in their hearts and souls, but it certainly seems like they're jerking people around. So I have endless patience for them, but Barrage is wonderful. 
still haven't played the expansion. I want to try the expansion, but we've been playing with new players, and there's already a fair amount, despite the fact that Barrage has all those things that I want out of a medium-heavy Euro game, which is, say, relatively focused scoring and lots of player interaction. I don't feel comfortable saying, and here's this other kind of thing, and this yet other kind of subsystem. But Huey really liked it, so we might be able to get a game in with him and introduce the expansion material and see how good that is. Looking forward to it. And that was Barrage. I have been playing the Vassal version of Thunderbolt Apache Leader. We commented that we got review copies of the Vassal module for Warfighter. I've talked about that a little bit. And then the Vassal, uh, review copy of the Vassal module for Thunderbolt Apache Leader. Thunderbolt Apache Leader is one of my favorite solitaire games. It's about running close air support in a variety of different theaters in a variety of different missions after the eponymous... Uh, th- uh, Thunderbolt, the the Warthog, as it's also known. You can also fly Apaches, as you imagine, the AC-130, which is, I, I'm a huge fan of, of, of the plane. At any rate, it is a daunting game in a lot of ways, because there's a lot of upkeep involved, there's a lot of chip manipulation. Just as an example, every time you're about to fly a sortie, you're going to have some number of vehicles, and you have to purchase and equip each individual piece of ordnance that those vehicles are then going to f- fire. That's on top of managing the stress level of all your pilots, etc., etc. So there's a lot going on. And I've commented in the past, when playing Thunderbolt Apache Leader, you want to be in a position where you can set it up and walk away. Sometimes people don't have the space to do this, and sometimes they don't have the wherewithal for this, and this is one of the reasons why Vassal is great. Save the game, leave, come back. There's another aspect of the Vassal module that's really interesting. I commented that the Warfighter module, although tremendous value for your money, was strange in that it was under-programmed. It didn't really have the kind of level of sophistication that even most free Vassal mods have. It had all the assets there, but you had to manipulate them, manipulate them yourself, and there wasn't really a good architectonic of the different components. Thunderbolt Apache Leader is much better, but, and I, I, I think this for me is actually a plus, you have to read the documentation in order to figure out how it works. It was so nostalgic. I haven't had to read documentation for a piece of software or much of anything outside a board game in many years. So, for example, in order to set up a variety of things, what you do is you drag the component representing that thing over to the round summary and you drop it. And then that component and a whole bunch of associated components will then immediately be populated in the appropriate windows elsewhere. But there's no mention of this in the window itself. You have to read it in the attached documentation. So, kudos for providing documentation. Kudos for providing that automation. Most of the time, in a tabletop simulator module or in a Vassal module, there would be some indication of that somewhere, like additional free-floating text or what have you. Yeah, or mouse over it and it might say, you know, in order to engage this, just drop it in the blah, blah, blah. Exactly. I am, and and this is going to be a bit of a strange connection, but I I, I hope it will make sense to you. I'm a big fan of lots of roguelikes. I also play roguelites, but I play roguelikes, my favorite being Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. And there's a kind of a joy in obtaining system mastery over a flexible and powerful, but not necessarily transparent interface. This is not to praise not transparent interfaces, but sometimes there's a joy in mastering it. And I have to say, some of my old roguelike impulses started firing in appreciative ways like, ooh, I remember this shortcut. <laughs> I, you know, just the joy of being able to work the thing and have, have have the things work properly. Like, remembering that you, you know, remove rings but take off armor in, in your favorite roguelike. Anyway, this is a bit of a strange analogy, but this is just to give you a sense of how working the interface was. I'm a big fan of the module. It is less of a steal than the Warfighter module because it just duplicates what's in the Thunderbolt Apache Leader base game. But if you want to be able to leave the game set up, as it were, and you don't normally have the physical space to do that, and you would rather do it in Vassal, this is a great way to do it. It's also much less Windows-intensive than a lot of other Vassal modules. I've commented about this in Vassal, Vassal in the past. It's a, So it's a very, very low system intensity and low hardware intensity Vassal module. It's very, very easy to use once you've read the documentation. So I recommend it very highly. I'm very glad that they've put in that level of effort and polish at DVG Games, or whatever fan did it for DVG games. It's sometimes hard to tell whether they commissioned it or whether they just co-opted some fans' works, work and started selling it retail. I'm a big fan of Thunderbolt Apache Leader. It's one of those fun paperwork games. But again, it's best in small bites. And that has absolutely been the pleasurable way to do it, as far as I'm concerned, in the Vassal module. So that is my review of the Thunderbolt Apache Leader Vassal module from DVG games. And those are the games we played last week. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. 
Mark, there is a computer game called Frostpunk. It's by the same people who did This War of Mine, Glass Cannon. The video game came out in April of 2018. This, you know, coming up season, they're going to have a Kickstarter for Frostpunk the board game. So I watched a bunch of videos on the vi- I watched a bunch of videos on the video game. It seemed very interesting and it's a cooperative game that you can play with four or more uh, sorry, up to four players and, and I'm very interested to see how they do that and I I'm interested. I'm going to read the rules. It looks cool. What it is is that it's the world has gone into like a winter apocalypse sort of deal and you they've uh, evacuated all of England and they're finding these like thermal uh pylons and they all sort of, you know, merge at this one and they start to, you know, build this community around one of these thermal pylons. So, looking forward to seeing how they do it. So Tom Russell is one of the co-founders of Hollenspiel. And he's designed such games as Irish Gage, Westphalia, 4X Table Battles, a whole bunch of really, really interesting designs. I still haven't played Westphalia. I really, really want to play Westphalia. And his most recent published design is The Field of the Cloth of Gold. And this is a... Simulation is too strong a word. The theme of the game is a famous meeting between the kings of England and France where basically nothing happened except they spent vast untold sums of money in effort to impress each other. You know, diplomacy. And... I have to say, I, I read his designer diary on Board Game Geek. We'll link to it in the episode descriptions. I love hearing Tom Russell talk about games. He talks about the design process. He talks about the publishing constraints, or rather the publishing environment that led him to design the game as he did. I'm very, very interested in trying the game, and I'm very interested to hear what he has to say about gaming generally. And uh, the theme of the game is just so appealing. I just love, I love games that are themed around absurd bits of nonsense. Whenever it can be approaching satire, whenever you're involved in an utterly foolish waste of money. I was a big fan of the theme of Last Will, for example. I didn't really like the game as much, but I really liked the theme. And this is actually historical, so it's it's so much the better. And I've really enjoyed some of the output of Hollenspiel in the past, our favorite being Meltwater, which is a past match of seminal design. But keep your eye out for the field of the cloth of gold. I know we hate dexterity games, Mark, but I thought I'd talk about this one anyway. Is it a, is it a roll and flick game? Is it a roll and write game coupled with flicking games? I've never heard of any such game. Sorry, it is not. It is called You're a You're a Penguin. I'm not a penguin. You're was, a penguin. I was going to translate that, but uh, I'd rather just like to pretend what it says and <laughs> make, make up silly things instead of knowing what it probably means. Anyway, it's from Japan. And I think it's very much like I've never played Super Rhino, uh, Super Rhino, Superhero Rhino, Super Rhino. <laughs> Not I know it's Super <laughs> Super Rhino Battle is the one I've played, but what's the first Rhino one? Hero Super Battle Rhino is the Heroes game you've played. Just Rhino Hero. Rhino Hero is the one you haven't played. So Rhino Hero, it look I think it must be very much like Rhino Hero because it's just a straight sort of tower, but it's a little bit like. Uh, the, crazy tower that we played where you can sort of like move it off to the side and you're placing these wooden penguins and these ice blocks and you're building this giant tower of ice and it just seems like it's going to be super fun i can't wait to give it a try it is on kickstarter you're a you're a penguin i'm down so cards against humanity i don't think we've ever talked about cards against humanity on this podcast because it's terrible it's not a good game it's not funny it punches down and it's lazy i feel like the world is coming around to this vision of Cards Against Humanity. I've been, you know, tracking its its progress for a while, mostly because I find it baffling, its, its popularity. I guess I kind of understand where it's coming from. But strangely enough, a company that was founded on the premise of giving people license to say terrible, terrible, lazy things wasn't a great place to work at. Who would have thought? Shocker, I know. Uh, but... There have been just a deluge of of repeats of past reports of abusive behavior suffered at the company, of new reports of abusive behavior suffered at the company, of people of color and women being marginalized and sidelined and ignored, and in some cases, gaslighted. And uh, all the result of this is uh, Max Temkin, one of the founders of Cards Against Humanity, is stepping aside. He is not going to be involved in the company anymore, except for he's still going to own an eighth of it, I believe. I'm not privy with the, the, the internal details. But the company has pledged that they're going to be improving. We'll see whether or not that happens. I still have no enthusiasm for the product, and I can't recommend that anyone play it. But this is just an indication. I just want to flag this moment that we're inching towards 
a little bit of the kind of cultural movements that the rest of the world has been experiencing. We're inching towards a little bit more accountability for people in power, a little bit more transparency about abuses and problems that people have been having. Uh, so there's there are tons and tons of articles of testimonials of people recounting their abuses, of people reporting on the structural problems in the company Cards Against Humanity. And I just wanted to call attention to this little moment we're having, and I think it all sounds like good progress. All right. Now, lastly in the news, we don't talk about uh, role-playing games very much, but I have two very distinct uh, memories in my role-playing past, of which I've played thousands, and one being Durance, and the second being Paranoia. And now on Kickstarter, you can get the new starter kit and all the extras. It's the new Paranoia starting box. It's an R&D source box. It's called The Infinite Hole. Is this very interesting sci-fi RPG where it's like sort of Big Brother. Everything's inside or like Load Runner where all of humanity is now in these domes. And the domes are all color-coded and you're all in these colored jumpsuits. And you have to stay within your 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 particular colored area or else the computer will vaporize you and when it does your clone will pop out somewhere else and off you go on your next adventure check it out it was an amazing experience when i played it paranoia i've never played paranoia I'm, uh, it's one of those classic role-playing systems with which i have very few very little familiarity but you've always spoken very highly of it and that is the news and why it doesn't matter now on to the topic of the week which is Ron Dells, an Australian music band from the 60s. No? Did you mean the Ron Dell, the American indie pop band from Albuquerque, New Mexico in the late 90s? No, eh? How about a really long pointy dagger, the Ron Dell? No. Okay, this is the serious one, because I think this is where it originally came from. The only other Rondell that I'm familiar with is the dangly bit of armor close to someone's armpit. This is what I'm talking about. So Rondell, like you said, it, it was round. And it was something that would block holes in your armor, like places where they could pierce through. And then from that, it graduated to uh, pieces of jewelry. So if you see uh, like circular red pieces of jewelry are also called roundels. And you can see they're all like pie shapes. And I think maybe that this is where it progressed into what we know today as the rondel system in our in our board games. Can we make Etymology Corner with Walker a regular sequence? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, we love rondels. Matt Kirk loves rondels. Why are rondels so amazing? Well, first of all, if we're going to talk about Matt Gertz, I think it's worth flagging that he is my second favorite designer. He's produced some absolutely masterwork games. Imperial is probably our shared favorite. We reviewed it not too long ago. I go back and forth on whether I prefer Imperial or Antica. Well, Antica 2 specifically. Depends on what day I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, but these are definitely like top five games for me, both of them. They both involve his seminal work, the Rondell. He also designed Hamburgum Nav Navigador that use exactly the same Rondell system, although, well, I shouldn't say exactly the same, because the way you pay to advance further on the Rondell, more on this later, varies a little bit. He even designed a game that kind of sort of has what you would call something that's Rondell adjacent. One of those games where it's not actually a rondel, but the action selection mechanism that you're employing is effectively similar in that you are limited geographically uh, based on what action you can do, but you can pay resources to skip ahead to a different re uh, to a different region. And that is, I think, the very underrated Princes of Machu Picchu, which is another Mackerts design. Uh, Mackerts has also done other stuff, but to me, he's always associated with his rondel games because th th those are my favorites. And in the case of, of Mackerts designs, one of the things that's great about the way he does rondels is how quick the turns are. And it really leads to a strong sense of flow. That is not an inherent feature of rondels, though. That is just a way that Matt Gertz instantiates it. So I just wanted to flag that before we start getting into the specifics of rondels. Well, those are part of the points. Before I go into these, let's just get, let's go on. I just want to read the, the Wikipedia, how they explain rondels. Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Wow. And then uh, I want to touch on those points that you just made. A rondel is a wheel shaped mechanism with a number of different options. A rondel game is where player's choice of actions is limited by his ability to move around the rondelle and is restricted from taking the same action repeatedly. A player is usually able to move further around the rondelle by paying a cost. Does the Wikipedia article really use the male pronoun as neuter? Yes. Oh, that's unfortunate. Anyway, so that sounds like a good description. Let me, me touch back to what you were talking about, where it says, because I have some points about the same thing, where it makes it faster, right? Because 
not only can you see what uh, the other players, what their options are, right? Because in lots of cases, they can't take the same action twice or they can only reach uh, a certain distance on the rondelle because you can look over at them and say they don't have the resources it takes to go any further. So you know what they're going to do. You can sort of plan multiple of, you know, I'm going to do this first and this and, you know, go around the de- rondelle making your actions more optimal, right? And therefore, like you said, it makes the game go faster because you can play, plan out your turn. I, I don't know that that's an inherent feature of the Rondell system itself or just the particular games that we're talking about. Because, for example, I could take any game where the turn structure is very cumbersome, where you do a lot of things over the course of, of, of a turn. I could easily imagine having a Rondell game where the turn sequence was complicated. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to advance two spaces and go to this the, this action space. Okay, first I do the upkeep phase, and then I refresh my hand, and then I get my income, and then I do this thing that's associated with the Rondell space or whatever. True. It's But but I, I, I agree with you that when coupled with a sort of quick atomistic action selection, it really encourages the kind of look ahead that further expedites the game. Now, but because of the way the Rondell works, and this, this I think is true of all Rondell designs, it encourages look ahead, but at the same time allows you to be flexible. Because as circumstances change, you're not committed to then going and doing that, that later thing you thought about. You can then either decide to pay the opportunity cost in either tempo or resources and go somewhere else. All this being said, the majority of what we're talking about now are games that uses the Rondell as an action selection, right? Which exactly. drives the main part of the game. Uh, and not only that, I feel it takes, uh, it, it, I don't want to say predictable because that sort of sounds negative, but because all of the actions are listed on the board, it also makes the game go faster because you know exactly what you're able to do. You know, there's not all this random, you know, well, I'm going to play this card that nobody's heard about or you do all this weird, you know, everything's listed on the board. You go around, I'm going to move, I'm going to build troops, I'm going to do this. It's all there, you know, six different things you can do and therefore, you know, makes the game go a little faster when it, when it's what we're talking about here. Yeah. I'm a sucker for clever action selection mechanisms, and indeed, I've been disappointed the past few role selection games I played, for example, because I didn't feel like the role selection was particularly clever. And the great thing about a rondelle as an action selection mechanism is that it fundamentally, I think most of the time, involves this trade-off between tempo and resource conservation. Let's take Antica as a specific example, because in Antica, all the spaces are good. You want to hit all the spaces, and it seems to make, on the face of it, it seems to make sense to hit all the spaces. Like, well, I'm going to generate marble, and then I get some marble. It's like, oh, well, then if I go these two spaces, I can turn in my gold to get some know-hows. Okay, I guess I'll do that. Okay, now I'm going to go get some steel. But that is a fine way to approach the game as a new player. But the trick is, that's taking too long. You're proceeding very slowly around, and you're doing all the things. What you have to do is you have to know when to spend precious resources to jump the queue. To say, okay, well, I do need gold, and I'm going to need it sooner or later, but you know what? I need to go do this thing now, so I'm going to pay the bank, jump ahead, and do this thing. And that fundamental trade-off between resources and tempo is absolutely beautiful when done properly. And in the good Rondel game, you have that in spades. Yeah, that's what I have written here, is that promotes a, uh, promotes a balanced game. Right, Because like you said, if you just advance slowly around, you're going to get all the stuff you need, and you're going to witness all the parts of the game, <laughs> but you're not you might not do as well as if you focus down on exactly what you need, when you need it, make those sacrifices when you need to. And, you know, exactly like you just said, the other thing that makes the game usually go quickly in most Rondell action selection games like this, there's no, you know, uh, end of round phase or cleanup phase. It's just around and around and around you go until the game is done. And then, so there's no, you know, slow down or anything like that. Absolutely. Just as a minor counterpoint to the thing you said, though, I feel like, and I commented on this when we reviewed Imperial. Imperial, although a brilliant game, I don't think it uses the rondelle quite as effectively because it it, it it depends on how you're structuring your rondelle, right? In Imperial, unlike games like Antica, unlike Hamburger, unlike Navigador, there are two spaces in the rondelle of Imperial that are vastly more consequential than all of the other spaces. Now, not, not more uh, advantageous, but consequential specifically taxation and investor. Those are the primary drivers of the engine of the game. And so knowing when to do that is super important. And near the end of the game, despite the fact that it is very costly in Imperial to skip spaces, you do tend to end sometimes with a kind of stale repetition of tax to investor, tax to investor, tax to investor. Uh, But that's just an indication that, again, much like other action selection mechanisms, what you do with it is sometimes less important than the overall structure of the game more broadly. And sometimes they can input like interesting 
either theme or mechanisms into this rondelle like they do in in Imperial where there's like a line across the rondelle and every time someone crosses it then something something else will happen it'll trigger some thematic thing in the game or and I'm going to be talking about uh, Wonderland's War and you know get your opinion on whether it's a rondelle system later on and it does the same thing when once you've passed all the way around it triggers something else as well and these are things interesting right well, to my mind, so let's talk about the sort of Rondell adjacent games. So not all the Rondell games have been designed by Matt Gertz. I remember the game Shipyard by uh, Vladimir Suki, which uh, decided to very much do the Yodog approach to Rondells. And it has, I think, four separate Rondells, some of whom interact with each other, some of whom don't. And it's just Rondells upon Rondells. I wanted to like Shipyard, but it didn't really come together. There's this cute bit of, you know, building your ship and then running your ship through a, a, a course that you designed yourself. But it was just... You know, a couple too many mechanisms didn't really come together the way that I wanted to, but very, very nice for a, for, for a few plays. Uh, Teotihuacan, I think, is undeniably a, rond- a rondel. It's a rondel where you have, and this is one of the interesting evolutions of it, you have multiple pieces moving along the rondel, not just a singular action selector. And their interactions between the two, your actions get more powerful if multiple of your selectors coincide. Yeah, it's much like Crusaders. You can, you know, build up your dice on an area, you know, as you're going around the rondel, it makes your actions yeah. more powerful. And, there's a there's a bunch of games like that where the the whole game board is the rondel, right? Tolkien is like that, where it's all these interlocking rondels that move around, and you're taking these actions and they rotate around. Oh wow! Uh, I I do not consider Tolkien a rondel game. Well, great. Some people have. I'm just going through from the list. People say that Great Western Trail is a rondel game. So to me, that is the interesting borderline case. Exactly, and so then we'll have to include Maracaibo in that. Uh, group as well okay so let's talk about it do you consider great western trail to be a rondelle game i really don't people keep saying that you know it's in in these categories but because you have like different paths you can go off you have different choices and and it the, it changes so greatly from game to game and during the game i i particularly don't think it is well that's one of the things that people say i i think i agree with you that great western trail doesn't feel like a rondelle game to me in the same way I don't know if I can defend it very well. No. The, the, the reason why I, I don't feel like it's a Rondell game in the same way, one of the reasons why is the Rondell is so big. And I don't, I don't just mean physically. I mean, there's you do a whole bunch of actions, different actions, completely separate from each other, before there's the kind of reset where you reach the end of the trail and, and, and start back at the beginning. So yes, it's a large loop. And yes, there's this geographical consideration of how far you move ahead to do the next action. But there's not this same sort of trade-off that, that I find because the core drivers of the game aren't divvied out on the rondelle in the same way. Again, I don't know that I would defend this necessarily, and I'm not particularly married to this definition. It just doesn't, it, it feels sufficiently different to me. No, like I said, but the way I'd word it is like, uh, it, I'm not going to say it's not a rondelle game, but to me, it's not a rondelle game. Reasonable. Just going back to your top, your comment about Crusaders, there are other games that effectively have a rondelle that use this sort of Moncala mechanism, right? Where you activate a space and you pick up all the pieces there and you start distributing them. So you don't have a token or, or pieces that act as the action selectors. Instead, you have these quasi resources that accumulate and then you distribute them later. The first game I played that was like that was Trajan, the, the Stefan Feld game, where the rondelle selection wasn't it wasn't one of the primary drivers of the game. There was a lot of other stuff going on, which is to say it's a Stephen Feld game and there's lots of stuff going on. I prefer the action selection version as opposed to... I prefer the, the, the more default action selection version over the Mandala version because I find... I found this in Crusaders too. You can just build yourself into a corner where it's not even a question of paying an opportunity cost. It's just the action is so anemic. You're not able to do anything with it. And so you're forced to engage in these weird sort of, well, I'll do this other action first, even though I've got nothing to do with it because I just need more pieces in that space. And that doesn't feel like the same sort of delicious tension that I feel in a, in a, in a standard rondelle The interesting part about Crusaders, though, is that you don't have your own rondelle, right? A lot of That's these true. games that we play with, it's like one main rondelle on the board and everyone uses it. In Crusaders, you have your own. And not only does it have that build up the space, but you can upgrade those spaces. And sometimes, depending on your on your player power, all it's going to be in a different order than everybody else's. And I, I found that pretty interesting in that game. Well, arguably the same is true of Great Western Trail, right? Because there are all those buildings that only you can activate. 
And that is one of those, th- those are one of the areas of player interaction in Great Western Trail. It's not huge on player interaction, but one of the ways you do is by building these buildings that are either burdens for other people that make their rondelle worse effectively, if you want to call it a rondelle game, which we are willing to do, but isn't necessarily our first impulse. Or you build these buildings that are only useful for you. So in that sense, yeah, an evolving rondelle can be done in lots of different ways. There are games that where the rondelle is off to the side. I really only have one of those, and that's Barrage that we already talked about. It's your own little economy engine where, sure. where, where you-, you spend your economy into this rondelle system, and as it turns around, you it's going to spit your resources back out again so you can use them again. I'm fascinated that you call that a rondelle, but you don't call a Great Western Trail a rondelle, because I never would have even yeah. considered Barrage to work. Y- yes, it's a wheel, absolutely. But it is effectively just a way to pin your resources. It's a, just a way to cycle your resources. It's not an action selector. It has nothing to do with your action selection. Well, in a way it does because there's different actions you can take on the board that will cause it to turn. Yes. But that is just it having, that is it experiencing consequences as a result of your actions. True. Not being implicated in your action selection per se. No, but it. Don't get me wrong. I love the mechanism. Yeah, I'm not. But I, like, I could see if it would just turned by itself, then then definitely not. But the fact that you can affect it and you can, you know, make it turn faster or slower or you know, you know, manipulate it or it's part of the strategy of the game. I think just adds to the fact that. Okay, it's just one of these, and one of the reasons why we haven't done these kind of categories in a while is because if you want to push hard enough, you can shove any kind of game into the bed of Procrustes and, and, and turn it into the necessary me- mechanism. We saw on the guild, for example, in the discussion of, of Rondell games, someone saying, well, if you really want to, you can call Side the Rondell game, where the Rondell is just really small. Oh, well, let's, come on, let's, <laughs> let's not give away stuff. I have some stuff at the end. Scythe's in there. <laughs> but well, anyway, let's just add add to uh, Barrage, because okay. not, not only are you adding your resources in there to be locked in, but, mm-hmm. they're, but you're also adding, uh, when you go to build, a, whatever you're paying for, uh, the action is also locked in as well, so that the so, technology so, that you the technology. To build the so you could also you, you could also say it's your action. So you can't go back to that action again, which is sort of what a rondelle does as well. It locks away <laughs> actions until they cut, until you go all the way around again. I'm not feeling it. It's it, imagine the following. I think it's it's honestly the circle that that's serving as a. Imagine instead what you did was you had uh, a turn track and you sock away buildings. And the technology and the resources on that turn track, a linear turn track, and every time period, it just advances one space closer to you, and when it gets off the edge of the board, it just comes back. Because that's all the wheel is doing. It's just a way to tie up resources for a while. Yeah, I suppose. The fact that it's a circle is kind of irrelevant. It's the circle of the rondelle. <laughs> a rondelle is a circle, and it's the circle of the rondelle, so clearly... I guess we're just going to have to disagree. I agree to disagree on Barrage, then. What other some other fantastic ro- Carlos Magnus, Carlos Magnus, Carlos Magnus, Big Chuck, Ch- Car- Carry the Big, Carry the Big, Carry Mags, Yeah, Round and Round and Round you go. Again, to me, it's a rondel if it's an action selection mechanism. If you really wanted to press the point, I guess I would concede that kind of sort of as Chucky Big Big moves around the periphery of the map. There's scoring. So in that sense, you're kind of sort of moving in a circle, selecting regions to score. So I guess it's borderline Rondel. But again, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it that. All right. So I've got my silly ones now. Do we have any other <laughs> do, do we have any other do, do you have any other like Rondell points to make? No, I I, I am ready for your silliness. All right. In Wonderland's War, you're drafting cards at the beginning of a phase. Right, and it's at the Mad Hatter's table. So there's all these cards in a big circle. Okay. And you're moving your action selector around and and cards are disappearing. And every time it goes around a certain point of the table, then you're taking corruption points. Okay. Is that a rondel? I don't know. Okay. I don't think so. Because again, if you arrange resources in a circle or if you sock away resources in a circle, that doesn't do it for me. For me, a rondel is... If the actions themselves are arranged in a circle and you manipulate your action selector or selectors in that circle to take certain kinds of actions to which they are cued. So if the cards you were drafting in this in this notion were not just cards you were taking, but instead the actions themselves that you were doing, maybe I could I could see that as, as a rondelle. But to me, that's I, I think the shape is misleading you. Gotcha. I think you just fixated on the shape. Well, how about shape? Scythe is a straight linear shape. Yeah. And 
part of the 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 rondelle thing is that it blocks an action so you can't take it again so you could say, say not necessarily not necessarily but it is in some in some rondelle system well in is... in the classic rondelle system by matt gertz you can do the same action twice in a row it's expensive but you can do it you know on tk you have to pave the five resources to go all the way around and i've seen it done it happens usually once every other game or or a couple times every other game or so in Imperial, I don't know. Oh, that, I'm sorry. That's not true. In Imperial, I have seen it done. And it was the right call, but it was very much an edge case. But All anyway, right. go on. All right. Uh, how can I word this one? So there's these. There's, <laughs> there's... Now I remember why, why we don't do these topics again. You it's come so up with good. these tortured explanations of games trying to get me to agree that there's a certain kind of thing. So there's all these actions and they're numbered. Okay. They're numbered. Got it. They're actions numbered. one through four. And people are going to draft them. They're going to draft them. And then it'll go around the table, and they then they get to perform those actions, and then they'll go back onto the table. And if, if someone picked, you know, say number one, then they'll get to draft first, and they'll go around and around the table. I don't think so. That's just that's just action selection. That's just an action draft. But then, but there's the, they're taking actions away from them that you can't take. Are you talking about El Grande? No, I'm talking about Twilight Imperium Four. <laughs> oh, right. So. <laughs> Classic. That's just a classic role selection, though. Why, right. why? Why? Why the fixation on the roundness? Like a rondel could be square. It could, it could be. <laughs> it speaking could be a hexagon. Of, speaking of rondels. Oh no! What have I done? Speaking of rondels that are square. No, I'm doomed. What if you're rolling dice? I'm gonna die in this to, basement. If you're going rolling dice to go around the rondel. <laughs> is the, it is it rondel then? Are the spaces that you land on the actions that you take? Yes. Maybe. What are you talking about now? Monopoly is a rondel game. No, they're not. No, that is not the action. No. The action you're taking is you're rolling a di- rolling dice and you're advancing. The thing that you advance on is not the action type you're doing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least. Oh, I'm going to die. Because I'm fixating on circles. How about if you're, you're, you're lost and you're bumping around and mindlessly going around in circles, not knowing what you're doing and not really caring what you're doing and just wasting time. No, Robo Rally is not a Rondell game. Oh, I was thinking more of Nexus, but sure. <laughs> I, okay, what about this? What if there are a whole bunch of Rondells on the ground? And sometimes you have to put your right hand on one of the rondelles, and sometimes you have to put your left <laughs> hand on one of the rondelles, and maybe one of your feet. And all the while, other people are also putting their limbs on various rondelles on the ground. And not only, rond- not only that, you're also spinning another wheel. To There's find another rondelle that, that, that tells, tells you, you what rondelle to go on. Yes. It's rondelles all the way down. Yeah, there, there you go. Twister, all, all Twister is down. clearly the ultimate rondelle game. It's so true. Well, on that note, thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bidney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bickey. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.